And it, it's just fantastic to be back and also to be amongst all these people who are engaged about back pain, colleagues who are interested and passionate, people who are living with back pain, and I include myself in that, and also the people who are supporting the people who have that journey here, and a very important group who's here today. So I'd like to tell you about what we're doing in our lab towards this uh, contribution in back pain. Let's see, that's a better way of doing it. Uh, it seems a little touchy. There we go. So in our lab, we focus on two things. The, the first thing is, what can we do to understand back pain better, to either create better diagnostics, better treatments, uh, preventative strategies, and that's a very long-term journey. So I won't be talking about that today. I'm gonna to talk to you about the other focus in our lab, is that what can we do for people right now who have back pain to make their lives better? And that's where we'll be going on. And in fact, I wanna talk specifically about a kind of back pain you've heard about a lot today, and this is a kind that we call either persistent or recurrent pain. It's not the kind you get for a couple of weeks and then if you're lucky it goes away and you maybe never see it again or later next year. This is the kind that either sticks around at a low level or a little more than that or fluctuates up and down over the course of weeks and it's just always there. And it's that kind of pain I want to talk to you about today. It's uh, sometimes called chronic, but we now kind of divide it into these other categories of persistent or recurrent. And oh, I'm giving my slides away here. All right, in this one, uh, what if I told you that despite all these problems that we have in studying back pain, there's actually some really good strategies for making your lives better with back pain. And we know about them now. It's not my opinion. It's the guidelines that we've heard about already, whether they come from the UK or from Denmark or from wherever they are, these guidelines tell us some very specific things that we can use to help people. So what are they? Well, I'll tell you what they're not. We know that for people who have back pain, surgery is not the first thing we want to do, and we've heard that very clearly. This is a small group of people with very specific problems where surgery we know works best and are trying to understand who it works better on as well. We also know there's a lot of medication out there for back pain, and you'd think maybe that would be high on the list of these guidelines of what to do for back pain like this, but it's actually not. Uh, paracetamol or, or Tylenol, uh, NSAIDs and opioids as we heard about are not the number one things that we recommend for people who have this kind of back pain. So what is it? Well, it's something we haven't heard a lot about, but it's something that we have all heard about in our daily lives, and that is the first line recommendations for this type of back pain is exercise and education. And you think, well, how could that be? How do we have such a big problem in back pain? It's not like exercise just got invented five years ago or telling people about back pain. How can this still be a problem? And you know, it's even worse than Dr. Swamy talked about in that not only is this the number one global problem uh, for disability in the world, it's been getting worse over the last decades. So we're not doing a very good job of addressing this. And in fact, it's not only getting worse, when we look at what we do for back pain, we're continuing to use the things on the guidelines that we say don't do that anymore. Imaging, uh, certain types of drugs at certain times, we know we shouldn't be doing this, but yet we're doing more and more of it. So what's the problem? If we know that exercise and education can really be effective, where's the disconnect? And uh, I'd like to tell you that that disconnect has a lot of different facets, but one big part of it is that this information is really overwhelming for all of us clinicians. And we have this romanticized version that in our spare time, we clinicians go to the library and we look through all the journals and we're able to synthesize all this information together and put it into packages that are ideally suited for patients and for clinicians and that are cost effective and we just somehow find a way to do this. And we actually don't do that. We don't have the time. So the ability to take all these new findings and get them out to you as patients is really difficult and that's a big part of the issue. So what do we do? Well, for our students these days, we, we try to bundle things into nice little packages for them so that they can take this and ingest it in discernible ways that make education easier. 
And that's what we thought we'd do in this case. We wanted to be like the little mother penguin who pre-digests the food and then vomits it back up in nice little packages. So I actually do an imitation of that, but I, I won't do that. <laughs> So for, for all of us who are frustrated, like I hear about this, I don't know how to do it in practice, or I trained at this 20 years ago, I might not be current, we, we've taken this and wrapped it up in a little package. And that package is called Glad Back. Now, some of you may have heard of Glad Hip and Knee. Uh, this is the next anatomic area in the Glad franchise, Glad Back. And what it consists of is this, it's a, a structured, uh, education program, a group education program, and it's not a pamphlet that just comes out of the back of the office door and there you go. These are specific messages that have been uh, created to address the, 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 the common beliefs and, and, and things that low back patients have that we need to get at. It's also a group structured exercise program because we know doing things in groups is more powerful. And also a big part of it is a database where we collect all this information because as you've heard, if we don't collect the information, we can't learn from it. And of course, this wasn't just all randomly brought together. This was done from a theoretical framework with a lot of people who, who found the best things to bring together in this nice little package that we can give to patients and clinicians. And this is what it kind of looks like. Um, if you're uh, someone who can enroll in the program, so you're not very acute, you don't need a lot of pain management, um, but you're these people that I've talked about, recurrent, persistent back pain. You come into the program, and for a week, you go two nights, one hour each, and we go through this messaging as a group of the important messages that are important to help you better cope with back pain. And then the next week, we begin an eight-week exercise program, uh, two nights a week, Okay, one hour each, and after eight weeks, you're done. So in less than 20 hours, you know, less than the hours that there are in a day, you've basically completed and graduated from the program. And these are just some examples of the messages that we have. These are very specific messages. My favorite is that pain is an alarm, pain is not a harm. And this comes from the Danish originators of this program where uh, in Denmark, they invented Lego, so it's very common for them, like us, to get up in the middle of the night, step on a piece of Lego, and we all know that experience of how painful that is. But we didn't break our foot, right? There's no tissue damage there, and that's a lot of the messaging that we have for most back pain, is that it is painful, but it doesn't mean that there's something wrong underneath with the tissues. And there's a number of other messages that we go through with back pain patients and learn these things. And then the exercises, and there's no secret exercise that you've never seen here before. The secret is in the packaging so that we can all get it done. And I mentioned it was created in Denmark, and just in the last year and a half, in fact, they're into their second rollout over the entire nation now of this program, Glad Back. It's really been successful. And I'm very fortunate to spend two months a year in Denmark and was able to convince them to bring this to Alberta. The first time the program was translated into English and brought anywhere outside of Denmark is here in Alberta. Uh, so in Danish, we learned how to do the program, did the translations over a bit of time, and brought it back uh, out of the U of A, but for all clinicians in Alberta. And just starting in February, we began this program of evaluating in the English program, can it do what we hope it can do? Will clinicians really find it easy to use in their settings? Will patients find it easy to use? And we wanted to look at those questions. So we started last February, and I gotta hand it to my Danish colleagues. Who visits Edmonton in February? <laughs> Nobody. This was a minus 35 week, it was terrible. And that, that's them on the upper le left on the first day being really excited, saying things like, oh, the snow sounds so beautiful underneath my feet. And they quickly decided that, yeah, it wasn't as beautiful as they thought, but they were hardy, they got it done, they, learned how to play a bit of hockey and drink some Tim Hortons, and we trained almost 40 clinicians, uh, 35 clinicians from throughout Alberta in the program, and then sent them along their way, uh, a mix of physical therapists and chiropractors. And uh, what we found is that 15 of the 19 clinics, now we sent them away and we said, just go to it. We, 
didn't know if they'd actually do it or not. And we found out that the majority did. They completed the program with groups of patients. And the, the, the small group of people or clinics that didn't complete the program, it was usually things like their town got evacuated from the summer fires or their families transferred. So lots of good reasons. It, there's no one who just said, yeah, I don't think it's going to work. Everyone was very enthusiastic about it. And there's some other data there about changing clinicians' attitudes and beliefs about imaging and other things, and it, it seemed to work very well. On the patient side, uh, patients we had, 88% of patients completed the whole program. And uh, I'll tell you a bit more about the data in a second here. But the, I'll, I'll say that this project was designed to really look at how easy the program was to do for clinicians. Uh, if they're not going to put it on, no patient's going to benefit. So we really didn't have the design to big, have the big, big numbers to look at how effective it is. But other people in Denmark are doing that. So the, the first pilot data is out from Denmark, and it really shows some things. And I'll, it's hard to read a slide like this, I apologize. But people's disability did improve, and people's pain improved. But the two things that improved the most were drug usage, 44% of the people in the program reduced their medication or eliminated their medication use. And I think it's 80% uh, reached a level of self-efficacy where they felt more confident in achieving what they needed to do over the day with whatever back pain still remained. So the future for this program I think looks very good. We've started round two. Uh, our clinicians are now taking in a second group and we're hoping to roll it out on a bigger scale in Alberta in 2020. The problem, and some of you may have picked up on this, is that this is an out-of-pocket program. And currently, right now, the state of the art in back pain in Alberta is that we're paying for the things that we know are second, third, fourth line in the guidelines, but we're not paying for the first line things that I've described here today. And that's okay because new information comes, new programs come, and we've got to have an evolution to get them into place, and that takes time. But that's what we're hoping to do by talking to other groups like you'll hear about from Mel Slump and uh, government and other agencies to try to show them that this may be uh, a very important aspect of all the different parts that we play as a collaborative team in back pain and back care. So I'm looking forward to some questions you might have at the panel, and uh, thank you very much for taking the time to come out today.